I promised a headline. I've got a headline. This is in the Washington Post. Remember, democracy dies in darkness. Opinion, Taylor the Renz said an editor was to blame. Is that okay? Now, in and of itself, that's kind of a weird headline. It kind of presupposes that you understand exactly what was happening at the Washington Post for a good chunk of time uh, and know exactly what this is talking about. If you don't, I'm not sure exactly how this is going to communicate that to you, other than the fact that, hey, this looks a little bit like a headlines thumbnail, right? This is this is the article that we have read through a couple of times now because it keeps popping up. Who won the Depp Heard trial? Content creators that went all in. It's got a Taylor Lorenz tweet and a big, long editor's note in the kind of graphical styling. Uh, and if you have that picture and that headline, maybe you're interested in this article. But just in terms of advertising, it's kind of a weird, uh, factless headline that we're going to start out with today. But we know what it means, right? Because we've been following this story and we know that Taylor Lorenz wrote an article about how the new media, uh, as she describes it, was eating the lunch of the old media and the old media needed to pay attention. And it was important primarily because the new media streamers, me, Alita at Legal Bites, others, uh, don't have the same ethical guidelines and boundaries that the journalists find themselves constrained by, which, of course, adds to the irony that what we're going to talk about today is a series of errors or potential communication flaws and those piling on each other. And I think there's a couple of reasons why this article was written, uh, and I'm not sure that it's because the Washington Post asked for it. In fact, I would I would offer that they maybe didn't, especially where Mr. Wemple comes out on this article. Uh, but there's one reason that I think is, is important as I have analyzed what's happened here uh, and doesn't get a satisfactory answer. And then there's the reason that is uh, suggested by this headline, which is, is it okay for Taylor Lorenz to call out an editor? And spoiler alert, Mr. Wemple is going to find that it is that it is okay. Now you might think, okay, so they're playing defensive ball for Taylor Lorenz, they've got the shields up. I will tell you, and we'll get there as we go through the wording, this is not a terribly Taylor Lorenz friendly article. And that's in and of itself unusual, because as I mentioned earlier in this video, the Washington Post is having a problem with comedy, with a T, with friendliness between its journalists, and has gone so far as to basically go out there and say, you guys need to stop attacking each other. It is the policy of the Washington Post that our journalists don't attack each other because we need to have some level of professionalism and trust in the institution and our journalists that our uh, fans, our customers can actually have for us. So the fact that that happens before this article goes up and this article, I'm going to be frank, throws some shade at Taylor Lorenz is interesting in and of itself in an article, mind you, not a tweet. So this is either more official and less problematic or more official and more problematic, depending on what perspective you bring to the table. Like I said, the Washington Post is the gift that does not end on this kind of thing. So let's look at this. First, we note a big old update. We're going to actually skip that. A few highlights here. Just ignore, uh, you know, bless our mess. Uh, we're going to go straight to the article here. This is how the article originally started. Washington Post staff writer Taylor Lorenz on Saturday posted a Twitter thread declaring that it was not she who inserted an erroneous line into her article. It was her editor. I did not write the line and was not aware it was inserted, wrote Lorenz. And then this link points actually to Oliver Darcy of CNN that captured the pictures of Taylor Lorenz. And I'm not sure exactly why it's done that way other than the fact that Ms. Lorenz has been on and off with kind of privating her entire Twitter th uh, thread since this all happened. And if you're writing an article in the Washington Post, you want to include links, you maybe want to make sure that it isn't something that is inaccessible at any given time that someone might read it. So you see here, we've gone over these tweets. We've went over everything here. As the author here suggests, her first tweet last Thursday, an incorrect line, was added to a story of mine before publishing due to a miscommunication with an editor. I did not write the line. I was not aware it was inserted. I asked for it to be removed right after the story went live. And again, giving the benefit of the doubt to Taylor Lorenz, one presumes she didn't ask for it to be removed in a stealth edit that the Washington Post actually engaged in, but following whatever rules the editors have at the Washington Post. And we're going to talk about those as part of this article. Um, so that's what we've got here so far. Taylor Lorenz says, it was an editor's fault. It wasn't my fault. And that can be seen as blame shifting a little bit. But of course, if it was in fact the 
editor that did this, we're going to talk about it in this article. There is some legitimacy to a journalist saying, hey, I shouldn't have this crush my byline. People assume that I did this. We should talk about who did this actually. Uh, and so I'm sympathetic to that position a little bit, as is this author, we will see. But certainly coming out of the gate and saying it wasn't me, it was an editor is blame shifting. I mean, we have to be honest there. This should have been a small correction for a miscommunication, but it turned into a multi-day media cycle intentionally aimed at discrediting the Washington Post and me. And we've talked about that in this space as well, which is to say, it certainly appears that there are factions in journalism that don't like Taylor Lorenz uh, and did, in fact, probably jump on this more than if it had been somebody else. That doesn't make it wrong to report on, which is where Taylor Lorenz kind of gets tripped up. But she clearly thinks that this is something that is heightened, that is an attack style against her personally. Uh, and I can't say that she is wrong insofar as there really was a lot of jumping on this particular story. One takeaway from Lorenz's thread was unmistakable. In a series of tweets, Lorenz blames her editor for having inserted the error into her story and says she is the victim of a bad faith campaign. And again, this is Oliver Darcy's tweet, right? This is what he says. In a series of tweets, blames her editor and says she's a victim of a bad faith campaign. This is important, right? I just said that Taylor Lorenz maybe has a point if an editor actually did this, as any of us would agree in terms of if we wrote an article, somebody inserted something that we didn't think was true and that we didn't know about, that could potentially be uh, something that we would say, hey, that's not my fault. Uh, now that miscommunication is still kind of passive voice, so we don't know what that means. But this paragraph from Eric Wemple gives away the game in terms of what he's thinking here. One takeaway from Lorenz's thread was unmistakable. And that's what Oliver Darcy takes away. Now, he says it's unmistakable, yet if we recall what Taylor Lorenz actually responds to Oliver Darcy, it's, no, actually, this type of coverage is so irresponsible and dangerous. It's misrepresenting my words to amplify a manufactured outrage campaign by right-wing media and radicalized influencers, which is driving a vicious harassment smear campaign against me. CNN is gleefully piling on. Now, as we've talked about in this space, I, I've neither harassed nor smeared Taylor Lorenz. I had no idea who she was before this story. She's, as ever, welcome to come on uh, and talk with me here in Hangouts and Headlines if she is so interested. Uh, but you now have a journalist at the Washington Post saying that Oliver Darcy's takeaway is obvious, even though he knows, and he will use it at the end of his article, that Taylor Lorenz came out and said, no, 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 that's not what any of this means. You're misrepresenting my words, or more specifically, the CNN is, or anybody else engaged in this vicious harassment and smear campaign. And now the Washington Post journalist says the actual concept here is unmistakable. Keep that in mind, because this is the Washington Post version of shade, and it'll become more obvious at the end of the article but here is the separation from Taylor Lorenz. And we will see it when we get the update that this is framed as the Taylor Lorenz situation uh, by this author. Blaming editors for mistakes sounds like a craven act, and indeed it can be, but it also happens occasionally at prominent US media outlets. Lorenz's pointed to a culpa, it's blaming someone else, is at odds with the spirit of post policy, however. And in this case, it received approval from the post's masthead according to a source at the paper. A Post spokesperson says, we provided input that we asked she take into consideration. Now, this paragraph is enormously difficult to read. Uh, and I will talk to you about why. I don't know whether to blame Eric Wemple. I don't know whether to blame the Washington Post. Maybe I should blame Eric Wemple's editor. I don't know. But if we go through this line by line, it becomes apparent that it's unclear what happens towards the end of this paragraph, right? Blaming editors for mistakes sounds like a craven act. Uh, and indeed it can be, okay. That's not committing one way or the other, but we can throw that sentence out. But it also happens occasionally at prominent U.S. media outlets. Okay, so here he's going to establish that you can actually blame editing. You can blame the editor at various places that perform journalism in especially the United States. Eric Wemple, if you go look at his bio, is actually kind of the media watchdog person for the Washington Post. And occasionally, apparently, he aims his spotlight at his employer itself. Then we get to the third sentence. Lorenz is pointed to a culpa is at odds with the spirit of post policy, however. And here he's setting up his argument. We'll see it when we get a little bit further in the article. Uh, but here he's saying, okay, blaming editors can be bad, but it also is happening in a lot of outlets, but 
It's worth noting that this outlet, the one that I work for and the one that Taylor Lorenz works for, says, no, you can't do that. And in this case, it received approval from the postmaster head, according to a source at the paper. Explain that sentence. What is the it in that sentence? What is it referring to? The previous sentence says, Lorenz has pointed to a culpa is at odds with the spirit of post policy, however. And in this case, it, that's probably not Taylor Lorenz, I don't think, uh, received approval from the post mass head according to a source at the paper. So is the it the post? Is the it the mass head? Is the it the post policy? And who's giving permission to this? Now, I think this is intended to suggest, even though that it is really throwing me, that Taylor Lorenz was given permission to blame the editor. But then we get to the last sentence. A, a post spokesperson says, we provided input that we asked she take into consideration. That doesn't sound like an institution that is thrilled with what Taylor Lorenz put out there on Twitter, because you could easily say, hey, we told her, this is the situation. This is the editor. You know what? Hey, I think that this is something that we should have talked about a little bit more. So the it received approval from the postmaster head, according to a source of the paper, I don't know how to read it, except that it is Lorenz blaming the editor. So I, I guess if you're going to take the concept of the tua culpa as the, the, the noun here and say that that's what received permission, I guess that's how we can read it. But then the we ask she take into consideration is just odd, right? Because you'd say effectively here as the post spokesperson, we gave permission. And that's not what this says. So I don't know whether Eric Wemple is taking a leap. I don't know whether he's got different background from the Washington Post. He obviously works there. But in any event, this paragraph for the lay person, heck, even for the lawyer, is tremendously difficult to unpack. And I don't know whether that's intentional or not, but that's where we go from here. The imbroglio kicked off a week ago with the publication of Lorenz's article on the internet, Content Creators Who Thrive from the Johnny Depp Amber Heard Defamation Trial. The original version said that two creators, Alita Majeka and the anonymous That Umbrella Guy, had been contacted for comment. Foxnews.com reported that the paper deleted that claim with a stealth edit. The Post published a series of corrections and an editor's note attempting to address the situation. It now reads, and we'll talk about that editor's note in a second. The weird part about this paragraph is the Foxnews.com reference. Right. And we've seen this used by Taylor Lorenz. We've seen her discuss right wing media campaigns and all these various things. And it is certainly true that various bits of Fox and others on the right side of the United States journalistic output uh, did leap at that. However, you're Eric Wemple. You're reporting on The Washington Post. This was stealth edited. I can attest to this with personal knowledge, as I can show in the first video that I did covering this that there is a change from what was existent in that article. It is otherwise unnoted. If you are a journalist at the Washington Post, it seems to me that you can admit to that here, especially since the editor's note actually says, during that process, the Post removed the incorrect statement from the story, but did not note its removal, a violation of our corrections policy. This is an admitted error from the Washington Post already. Why? does foxnews.com enter into this paragraph, right? We do rhetorical analysis here. What is happening? Foxnews.com reported that the paper deleted the claim with a stealth edit. Should be, but the paper deleted the claim with a stealth edit, right? They admit to it. You don't need a third party sourcing on this. This, to me, looks like it's designed for the same intent that Taylor Lorenz calls up the right-wing media, that if you're reading this quickly or you're otherwise following along uh, on a skimming kind of basis, then you say, oh, well, Fox News, I can disregard because I disregard Fox News. And very often I'd say you're wise to do so. I'd also say you're very wise to do so with respect to Washington Post articles, as it turns out. And that goes for most outlets that can go either direction on these kinds of things. But why frame it in this way unless you mean to discredit it in some form or fashion? I don't know. I have no idea on this one, but it gets weird. Here's the editor's note. I've highlighted, of course, in fact, only Majeka was asked via Instagram as the big thing that continues to annoy on this entire saga, right? We've got this huge editor's note. It's more than 100 words long. It goes at the beginning of this article. Taylor Lorenz has complained about it. Eric Wemple is reporting on Taylor Lorenz complaining about it. And yet, right now in the article, survives this concept. 
The first published version of the story stated incorrectly that internet influencers Alita Majeka, uh, Alita Majeka and that umbrella guy had been contacted for comment before publication. In fact, only Majeka was asked via Instagram. And we know that this appears to be untrue. We know that Alita says it's untrue. More importantly, we know that Taylor Lorenz says it's untrue. Her third tweet, after the story went live, I reached out to both YouTubers. And yet, the Washington Post puts this as its editor's note. And as Eric Wemple here of the Washington Post says, Hot Air's John Sexton pointed out that by Lorenz's own account, she didn't contact either YouTuber for comment until after the story went live a circumstance in conflict with the editor's note and which indicates that the request for comment to Majeka occurred prior to publication via Instagram. This is obvious to everyone. Taylor Lorenz does not appear to be fighting this, but the Washington Post put this in its editor's note. And here's the kicker. They refused to answer Eric Wemple about this particular notion. Eric Wemple, journalist for the Washington Post, interviews the Washington Post on this topic and the Washington Post says, nah, or as he puts it in this article, we've asked the Post for clarification on this point because it matters. This is Eric Wemple doubling down, right? He could have just said, hey, they refuse to answer. The Post refuses comment, whatever. He says, we've asked for clarification because it matters. This is an important thing. I'm going to underline it. I'm going to hang a lampshade on it. This is critical because why? If the Post can't nail down the facts in an editor's note, after looking at this thing five separate times, where else should we trust it to do so? Bingo. Absolutely. As much as Taylor Lorenz or others uh, defending what has happened here want to say this isn't important. And I think that calling Alita at Legal Bites up before the article goes to publish isn't important. I think this is an immaterial factor in this article. The fact that they can't get this thing right, that they are in full control of, that they have the knowledge base on, that they're going public with in ways that are separate from what they are telling the world that doesn't follow this that closely is enormously important because they are the ones that are reporting on everything else that you might otherwise read in their paper. And Eric Wemple is exactly right on that. And what does the Washington Post say to him? That stands as is says a Post spokesperson, we won't be able to get into what the internal discussions were. That's all we're going to get. And I think part of the reason that this article exists, honestly, is because Eric Wemple thinks this is important, thinks it matters, and it doesn't make any sense to him, right? This seems very clear. You put in your editor's note that Alita Majeka was, in fact, asked on Instagram to comment before publication. Right. And others have pointed out, well, if you strictly parse this sentence, in fact, only Majeka was asked via Instagram. It only implies that it's before publication. And that's really after publication. They're playing tricks with you. One, no, it doesn't. The in fact points back to before publication. And so they are done and dead on that. But let's say that that was a successful trickeration. That is exactly the opposite of what you want from your journalistic press. You do not want to believe that you have to parse it like it's a damn contract with opposing counsel to figure out what the truth is that they're trying to trick you in every corner. So honestly, if this was a successful trick, and it is not, it would actually be more damning for the Washington Post because you cannot have that level of lack of trust with who you're otherwise paying to provide you with new services. And I can't speak for the Washington Post's circulation level or profitability, but if that kind of thing happens, this is bad enough. If it really is determined that they're trying to trick you on everything all the time, whether it matters or not, there is no possible way I could recommend anyone to read anything from an outlet that does that kind of thing. And so I think Eric Wemple wrote this article in part because of the question that he asked at the top, but also to highlight this. This is ridiculous. The Washington Post is being called out on all corners for exactly this, and they say that stands as is. Sorry, bro. We're going to refuse to answer your question, fellow journalist of the Washington Post. And that's the big ticket item here to me. We'll see that he comes out with the conclusion that it should be okay to question editors. I'm not as invested in the answer to that question as a non-journalist uh, as I am in what you go out with to your customers, to your readers, to the folks that you are purported to be telling the truth to. And now I don't know whether I can believe that you're the actual Washington Post. You put the date in the masthead. I don't know if I can believe that if this is the level that we're going to get to. But let's talk about the second question. Another question hanging over the editor's note relates to policy. 
What if the first iteration had asserted that the mistake came off the keyboard of an editor? Any such declaration would grind against a long-standing provision of the Post's Standards Guide, which reads, we do not attribute blame to individual reporters or editors, for example, because of a reporting error or because of an editing error. But we may note that an error was the result of a production problem or because incorrect information came to us from a trusted source, wire services, individuals quoted, etc. The policy controls how the newspaper articulates corrections and editor's notes and has a more tenuous sway over tweets and other statements from the Post. Now, this actually goes to the heart of what the Post has been dealing with right now, which is, is Twitter the workplace? What are we allowed to control of our journalists over there? Taylor Lorenz doesn't ask for a correction or an editor's note that says it was the editor's fault. She goes out on Twitter and proclaims it to the world. And so Eric Wimpel is kind of figuring out what that should mean here as he works through his opinion piece and says, look, we're not allowed to attribute blame to individual reporters or editors formally, but it holds a more tenuous sway over tweets and other statements. And this is how the Post journalists wound up sniping at each other for a long period of time. Now, the Post wound up firing the journalist that was doing that. It's unclear whether they intend to take a stronger tack against Twitter and social media in general, but it wouldn't surprise me if that's where they wound up because they've had so much difficulty in the last, I don't know, a few months at least on this particular topic. So maybe they go in and their corrections policy more specifically associates itself with social media, and you'll see that recommended here by Mr. Wemple. In a 2006 column, then Post Ombudsman, Deborah Howell traced the philosophical roots of the Post's aversion to due to an editing error. Then exe executive editor Len Downey told Howell, reporters get bylines and prizes when they do well and editors don't, so they shouldn't be thrown under the bus effectively. Peter Baker, then a White House correspondent at the Post, countered, writers are held accountable because our names are on the bylines. Why should writers be held accountable when it's not their fault? And those are decent arguments. Honestly, in a vacuum, I would tend to side with the journalist here. If, it, if your name is on something and you didn't put it in there, I don't have any problem saying, hey, I didn't put it in there. Correct, says the New York Times. And so here, Mr. Wemple's pointing out, as he indicated earlier on in the article, other outlets do it differently. The New York Times, for instance, that's because a correction frontally addresses an issue in a May 9th story, and they say, because of an editing error, an earlier version of this article mis misidentified Lincoln College as a historically black college. It is a predominantly black college, not a Department of Education listed HBCU. So an editor went in, changed a reference, and the journalist here would have been blamed for it, except for the New York Times got in front of it and said, well, that's an editor. I don't have any problem with this approach. And I think Eric Wemple doesn't have any problem with this approach. Now, of course, he's tilted. He's biased. He's a journalist. He wants to be able to say if something like this were to happen to him, he could blame the editor. So that's fine, but it doesn't make his argument wrong. Philip B. Corbett, associate managing editor for Standards at the Times, tells the Eric Wemple blog, and I looked this up. I, I could not find it. It appears to be a reference to the Washington Post uh, item, and I don't know what relation it has to Eric Wemple as a person and as a journalist for the Washington Post. So it's a little bit of an odd reference here. He does it to the blog via email. That has long been our normal practice. It's simply an effort to be fair to reporters whose names are on the story and shield them from criticism if they aren't to blame for a mistake. All that makes sense, checks out. Many outlets, including CNN, the Associated Press, USA Today, Slate, MSNBC, The Daily Beast, and yes, even The Post, have at least dabbled in this formulation. And this is an eclectic, what, what an eclectic group of journalistic outlets, I don't know what you want to do with Slate and the Daily Beast in this formulation, uh, to bring in uh, to this particular argument. But he's trying to establish, hey, a lot of folks let you blame the editor, though a CNN spokeswoman says it's not policy to attribute mistakes to editors. They want to focus on what is being corrected. Uh, or the AP spokeswoman says that. Decades ago, and here comes his thesis, the post's institutional approach to corrections made more sense. The work of reporters back then wasn't fly specked on social media sites, dissected for mistakes and repurposed for the next instance of wrongdoing or alleged wrongdoing. These days it is. If the argument for the Post's policy were ever correct, it's not anymore. So not actually a ton of argumentative evidence here. Uh, we go from other people do it to social media has changed everything. And I don't know whether that's accurate or not, right? I have no idea. I have a feeling that even in the 1920s, journalistic output was still evaluated pretty closely. I know for a fact that a lot of newspapers and other journalistic outlets had ombudsmen that actually 
looked after the overall brand of the institution and was essentially the devil's advocate role against some of the things that the institution was doing and explaining certain choices to the readership. Those roles don't appear to exist anymore. So I'm not positive that I buy this as an effective argument, but I'm not sure it needs to be. I, I do find myself more sympathetic to if your byline is on there and somebody else changes it, you should be able to say that. Uh, but I find that as a kind of notion of justness or rightness uh, rather than social media is looking at our stuff more closely. Because as a non-journalist looking at this, I'm not terribly sympathetic to you're getting called out more because you're making more mistakes is a reason why you should change what you're allowed to say about how those mistakes were made. I don't think that actually follows from the logic of social media, but that's his overall premise. And if the Post revisits its correction policy, it may want to lay down a guideline or two about how its journalists respond to social media brouhaha's. We have a responsibility to recognize these bad faith campaigns for what they are and when these sorts of things do and do not warrant acknowledgement, wrote Lorenz after the uproar over her Depp Heard piece. She also wrapped CNN. This type of coverage is so irresponsible and dangerous. It's misrepresenting my words to amplify a manufactured outrage campaign by right-wing media and radicalized influencers, which is driving a vicious harassment smear campaign against me CNN is gleefully piling on. So I told you, I promised you, he would come back to this because he clearly disagrees with Taylor Lorenz's position here as he indicates in his final line. That outrage works much better when a 135 word editor's note isn't hanging over your article. And that's where he finishes off things. So a ton of shade thrown at Taylor Lorenz in the original article that he writes. And that's before we even get to the update and note. Now, before we get to that update and note, I do have a couple of super chats. So let's talk about those. Let me know how you feel about Mr. Wemple's output, how the Washington Post just stonewalls him on what I consider to be the most important question arising out of this so that he can navel gaze on whether editors should be thrown under buses or not. Uh, but I still think it's useful to note that the Washington Post continues to spiral on this question in a way that I don't think we could have anticipated going in. So let's take a couple of those super chats. Uh, we, we did this one. Thank you so much, J. Birdie Lewis. Skew SME, Washington Post and their staff are so self-conscious and weirdly self-important. Smiley face, smiley face, smiley face. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's the nature of the beast to be at a, a, a national outlet, to think of yourself very high up on the food chain. We're seeing a lot of that writ large on social media. One story I could possibly bring up is some stuff that, the, that uh, I think it's NBC, it might be MSNBC, uh, tech correspondent person is continuing to bring up on social media over the last 24 or 48 hours. I'm not entirely certain what to do with tweets vis-a-vis uh, -vis headlines, uh, but we might cover it later on. There's certainly an aura of who are these people to come play in our playground. Uh, and I'm all for it. You know, bring it on for these arguments. SL, maybe sing our fight song to push to 150,000, go blue. I don't know. Can people uh, withdraw that money if they get upset? Uh, at uh, just a proud Wolverine and, and going blue on this kind of thing. Maybe I could do that. We'll see. We'll see. Thank you so much, SL. Aaron Flemons, the fundraiser was entertaining and informative. Wonderful. I'm sharing the link with my workmates today. Good work, Hogue. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate it. Britt Cormier, from before you read the article, Washington Post seems to be Ouroboros, and I never get that pronunciation right, with this drama, the snake that eats its tail. You know. Uh, yes, I, uh, I think that they can't stop can't stop, won't stop <laughs> covering themselves. It's it's interesting, right? Because it's it's making things worse, but it's also kind of feeding a certain institutional egoism. It's it's bizarre, uh, but I love watching it because I think it is informative for our media outlets and, and what to take from them when it's a news story that doesn't have all this going on with it, right? Zach Frisch, coffee money and a thanks for the breakdown. Thank you, Zach. I can't believe Washington Post wrote this article. This is like blameception. Is the Washington Post actually run by teenagers? Like, wow, have some poise already and quit petty fogging to try and save face. I don't recognize that term. Um, but uh, thank you so much, Zach. I really appreciate it. And apple pie, democracy dies in darkness is fitting. This is as convoluted and complex as a Kingdom Hearts game plot. They do talk a lot about the darkness in Kingdom Hearts. I love that tweet. Or I love that uh, super chat. I apologize. Nobody's tweeting here except for Taylor Lorenz. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the support. And yeah, it's it's absolutely crazy. It's absolutely crazy. But it is not done, right? It is not done. So let's scroll back up to the top, as I promised, 
And we will see that this entire thing is gotten worse. Or as Eric Wempel says at the top, to get, again, give you a kind of connotation, a hint at how he feels about this whole thing. The fallout from the Lorenz story continues. On Thursday, members of the Post Features staff held a meeting with Post Executive Editor Sally Busby, Senior Managing Editor Cameron Barr, Managing Editor of Diversity and Inclusion Krista Thompson, and Managing Editor of Digital News Kat Downs Mulder. At issue was a letter from Features staffers citing an article in the Daily Beast identifying Deputy Features Editor David Mallets as the one who inserted the mistake about comment requests to YouTube cr content creators and reporting that the affair may cost Mallets a promotion to top features editor. It's a very long sentence in this update, but what this says is that staffers at the Washington Post apparently wrote a letter to their managing editor saying that there's an issue because the Daily Beast has identified the editor that Taylor Lorenz hinted at, David Mallets here, as the one who inserted the mistake and it may cost him a promotion to top features editor. He's apparently deputy features editor, and he was set to be promoted to top features editor. Now, why do these features staffers think that was the case? Well, according to three sources at the meeting, one reporter pressed Busby, remember she's the head of all this, on specifics, saying that colleagues had learned that Busby had offered Mallets the job on Thursday, June 2nd, and then rescinded the offer the following Monday. Busby, according to these sources, didn't deny the timeline, which isn't, of course, the same as accepting the truthfulness of it, but insisted that Mallets was in no way punished for his mistake. Staffers who spoke at the meeting, according to the sources, were furious with Busby's decision and asked whether it could be reversed. She was resistant to that suggestion, say the sources. A Post spokeswoman said, again, to Mr. Wemple, we will not be commenting. Can't get anything out of his employer. Uh, but he can publish these at least. So I guess give credit where it's due. So after this article goes up, the feature staff at the Washington Post has another insurrection within the halls of this institution says, look, we found out that our current deputy features guy was going to be the head guy. And he got his job canceled, essentially, after he was offered it on Thursday and after the weekend's events with Taylor Lorenz really having a very, very long Twitter exchange and attacking everybody and everyone on uh, that platform over the weekend. He gets the job offer rescinded on Monday. Seems like Eric Wemple wants us to believe that that's the truth. There's no indication that it is not and that the executive editor here is refusing to otherwise change that up, which leaves you, at least in terms of tone and suggestion from this author, that with the notion that Taylor Lorenz is the center of the maelstrom here, that this all happens because Taylor Lorenz goes out with an article like this, goes out and attacks everybody and everything after it all happens, says it's a right-wing conspiracy, calls various YouTubers that want to comment on these topics radicalized influencers. I don't know, maybe we'll do a shirt or something with that on it. Uh, and then all hell breaks loose and there's another loss of faith, another mutiny within this particular journalistic outlet. And it gets reported on in their own pages. Uh, so there is all hell breaking loose at the Washington Post right now. Honestly, with this set of events, I'm not sure uh, that Ms. Busby here uh, is, is going to last a very long time in this role. Maybe she writes the ship and we never hear her name again. But as it stands right this second, there are so, so many problems. And this is not what you want from your newspaper. You don't want all of this to go out there. We say all press is good press. This isn't the kind of thing that helps you trust the Washington Post to get things right. It's all politics. It's all sniping. It's all teenagers. It's all high school. And frankly, it's a little bit disappointing because the Washington Post is a major paper. It is a paper that has a high level of circulation and people watching what it does here in the United States. And I don't know whether that'll last because honestly, this is the kind of thing that is a real turnoff for me. Uh, looking at all of this going on behind the scenes and in back offices and whatnot. So that's the story I wanted to talk about. I think somebody said blameception. That really is what it feels like to me is we've got this situation here where the Washington Post just keeps finding people to blame and losing the faith of the people that they really need it from uh, the most. Uh, and so that's the article for this morning.